My name is William Delgado. I'm the state senator of the second legislative district and um, former chair of public health, former chair of human services. For those of you who, who may not be familiar with my background, uh, I say Google it. Uh, we're very public <laughs> record. I still think that's pretty cool. I still tell my mother at 90 years old, Mira, mami, yo estoy, puede verme en la computadora. Eh, bien chévere. Nice to see you, Pete. And, um, and uh, it resonates, uh, and, and, and we could, through technology, uh, stay in touch in that manner. Um, but now I'm chairing education. And believe me, as a former DCFS worker and, uh, and someone who's done 20 years of health fairs in the community, and many of you were part of that, 6,000 people a day, just one day a year in my community. And um, we have finished with those health fairs, um, yet it must Someone must pick them up. And we talk about the people who made that happen. Some of them are on this panel because they're the thinkers. They were the curriculum. They were the ones who helped me and Senator Miguel del Valle understand how to implement this on a community level. I am not a healthcare professional. I do not have the background you all bring. I am a layman and I'm a public policy maker in your honor and to carry your flag through the General Assembly and anywhere else that you tell me to go. So that's my role. And as moderator, uh, I get to just sit up here and introduce these wonderful personalities. And we may have one who breaks from us a little early, or we may want to go further. And each member, as we segue right into uh, this workshop, we will have as a coordinator, and also I want to right away thank uh, Dr. Andrew Sung, who uh, who's actually put this all together. I, I just got in from Springfield. Uh, as we, um, many of us are so proud, the foundation has put this again, the Latino Caucus Foundation together, and have brought us some very prominent members of the Latino community and overall communities, be it from whatever nationality, to bring us the information we need. Um, and so they're gonna have 10 minutes to open as to who they are, what is it that they represent, and why they're part of this distinguished panel. Because as you know, I will always operate in making sure that we have substantive measures that we can have results from at the end of the day. So with no further ado, um, and then we'll go to questions, and there should be more than adequate time if you have questions uh, regarding. And so I believe after you hear the spiel, we'll be able to connect these wonderful pearls, and this will make a lot of sense, and we will learn from them. Uh, but no further ado, uh, we have uh, Mr. Julio Rodriguez, who will start off for us. Um, and he is one of our major funders and a good friend who's always been very concerned about where the money goes in our community. Number two, we have Elba Randasu. Um, we have, of course, Juan Salgado. We have Susana Gonzalez, who also, um, I have to be very biased, is also the chairperson of my health committee for the last 20 years in Miguel del Valle, and was very responsible for all of the health fairs that were taking place in, in, in uh, Mozart Park on Armitage. And I get a lot of the credit with my name on it, but if you really want to see who does the work, there she is. Um, and uh, with that said and done, um, and a great RN, by the way, um, and then, of course, Dr. Andrew's son. And, and I hopefully I can get a flu shot, Susanna. You can take care of me to make sure. Because you know I'm a hypochondriac, guys. I'm always. Porque estoy enfermo de no poder sanar nuestra comunidad cuando llega a nivel de salud. Las frustraciones tenía razón y tiene razón. El tiempo te dio la razón, Carmen. En términos de lo que está sucediendo con la salud, en términos de la póliza federal. Y cómo es que estamos sufriendo en términos de los precios que nosotros estamos ahora viendo en términos de, los pre, de, de, de las tarifas que tenemos que pagar. I said in, in Spanish to, to a, a, a director here who has is, who is constructively criticized the legislature and has constructively criticized in a very positive way uh, work that we do in the Latino community as to health care for all and understanding that the premiums are coming back pretty heavy as to the uh, co-pays. And having been one of the authors of the legislation with now President Barack Obama in 2002 here in the state of Illinois, 
because I was the chief sponsor of universal health care in the House of Representatives. Uh, Carmen was one of our, our allies and advisors, and uh, she has been able to now point out the downsides. And since it's far removed from me now, uh, a few years ago, she told me these things would occur, and she is right on money. And today, in 2015, I come to say time has given you uh, the correct, and you were absolutely right. And everyone now is scurrying to fix a lot of those problems. And in Illinois, we may finally have an exchange. So I know you're working on some of that. Uh, but, and that's a sidebar, sidetrack. I'm sure some of you are familiar with what we're talking about, and all of you should be familiar with what we're talking about. But with no further ado, I'm going to open this up to Mr. Julio Rodriguez, who's going to identify his agency, who he is, what he does, and then he will get into a 10 minute. And after that, um, we'll move on to Elba Aranda Shu. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. So I am with the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, and my primary role is in overseeing the workforce development programs. More often than not, what you will hear is sort of two tenements of that. The Workforce Investment Act, or WEA, and I'll talk a little bit about that because major legislation was passed. It was reauthorized and renamed in July of this year. And there's some very exciting things, some very uh, grand opportunities for us as a state because we've been doing a lot of the things that in the new legislation really supports us continuing to move forward. The next piece of sort of program is really the state's program, and that's the JTED program. Some of you may be aware of it. Some of the folks up here get funding for that. It's a very small program but it is one of the programs that has showed us the most success for getting people who are the most vulnerable into some type of career pathway, some kind of career track. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a historical perspective on how the department has been doing workforce development and what our philosophy has been, and then where do we see we're us moving under the new legislation, and possibly, you know, right now I can tell you where we are today. Tomorrow is a new day, as many of you know, we have a new administration, so, There'll definitely be new opportunities and new directions, but at this point, I'm gonna give you a sense of where we are today and where we hope to go, given the larger sort of landscape. Also, I'll tell you that there'll be some funding opportunities that I wanna let you know about, so those of you who are grant writers or executive directors, please take note, because there is two opportunities that will be coming up. Um, both for incumbent, for people who are already working and needing to move up in order to increase their skills, and then those folks who um, are in the WIA or WIA eligible programs and opportunities to fund more programs using those dollars. So first let me say that, so I've been with the department over a decade. This is actually the longest job I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so I need some career coaching, no. Um, but it's, it's been interesting to me because I started when the field of workforce development was really kind of expanding and really thinking about how do we bring all these various systems together. And we started uh, with an $18 million investment looking at how do you bring education, workforce, and economic development together to create opportunities for people who were being left behind. And we started what we call the Critical Skills Initiative. And through that initiative, we worked under the 10 economic development plan or areas of the state and really developed programs that really helped to address that issue. In fact, I'll, I'm gonna give Juan some kudos here because one of the programs that came out of that initiative was Institutos Cajeras de Salud. And that was really a model program that really not only just flourished here, but really became a national model and became a real opportunity for us to talk about how do you combine adult education, workforce development, and think about a pathways to uh, healthcare in a way that people had never thought of before. And, and I wanna just give kudos to Juan because he was really an early pioneer in that. Now, fast forward to today. Um, in July, the, gov or the president signed a bill called the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act, WIOA. So <laughs> just put an O in between the I and the A, and you get what the new legislation is. But the key sort of principles of that legislation are development of career pathways, work-based learning, and I also want to give kudos to St. Augustine because they have done a lot of work with us around taking workers who are right now underemployed and underskilled in their current jobs 
and getting them the types of skills that they need to continue to advance into jobs that they have now. Um, they've been doing a lot of successful models for us in a number of areas from manufacturing to uh, TDL and we think there's real opportunities there to continue to expand those. The other really critical piece in the new legislation is the whole idea of work-based learning. And work-based learning is really important because it means moving away from the traditional model of saying people have to come to a university or to a community college to get the kind of training they need to advance. We really believe the goal is to really engage employers and put programs in place right in the job site, work with them around development of curriculum, and I went, uh, do uh, kudos to Alba and the work that she's been doing because they've really been a leader on the employer engagement and really through the JTED program and other programs that they run on really getting healthcare providers to really get involved in the development of the program and ultimately getting people in the workplace to be able to advance. And we want to continue to support those areas. Another thing about work-based learning is it allows us to do something that under WIA we didn't do very much of, which is on-the-job training and work experience. When you think about people coming into healthcare, if you think somebody who's working in the cafeteria, who's been there 15 years and has not had the opportunity to really experience what it would be like to go into healthcare, those are good strategies for beginning to move them from one part of the hospital into the other. And how do we continue to expand on that? And the new legislation really gives us opportunities for doing that. The other thing I, that it also does is on top of the career pathways and career uh, and the work-based learning, it also for the first time creates integration between adult education, uh, career and technical education, voc rehabilitation, and then what we call Wagner Pizer and Title I, which is the core program of WIA. We are now going to create a unified plan in which our performance measures all have to align themselves. So, scary business, but we're very lucky in Illinois in that with all of those partners we've been working very closely on. We've actually been a leading uh, state when it comes to people with disabilities. We've actually funded a number of programs working with kids with autism, getting them into uh, IT. We see that that's another growing opportunity. Healthcare IT is going to continue to expand and we see that opportunity of us, all these systems working together to get people into that field as another place for us to begin to do more work. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that we had established the P to 20 Council and uh, Senator Miguel de Valle is the chair of that. And we've really been working with not only creating the sort of pipeline um, strategies and thinking about how do we take the whole system of education and align it so that we have what we call on-ramps for people. Because the traditional model of high school to college to work those models don't work, and we have to figure out new ways for creating on-ramps for folks. And that's what this, uh, these, this funding really gives us the opportunity to do. The other thing that I wanted to say in terms of the JTED program, our state program, we've also begun to take that program and have it model in the same way that what we're doing with the Workforce Investment Act program. And we're trying to do more stuff around career pathways with that. And lastly, I'll end with the other thing that we've been doing over the last three to four years if we started what we call learning exchanges. And learning exchanges are actually run by businesses and they're in the key areas of the state where we have, where we see growth and demand occupation. So healthcare being one of those. And the idea is to get business people to tell us what do we, what do they think works? How do we advance the goals that they have? And how do, do we develop programs like the ones I've mentioned already and expand those across the state? There are two funding opportunities. We are going to be releasing an RFP for the JTED program. That will probably come out early spring. I don't know if this is wood, but you know, assuming the budget discussions go well, we should be able to get those funds out. And currently, right now, if you go to the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunities website, there is an <laughs> RFP for what we call rapid response funds. And these are funds that are targeted to people who have been displaced from their job and are looking to get into a new career track. And what we're really looking for under those funds, and St. Augustine is a great model of what they've been doing, is they identify a company and they work with that company and they actually take the skills of the people that are needed and then bring those people in. They also work with people who are currently employed 
and advance their skills. I'll give you one example and then I'll stop. So, and because I'm looking at Marta Serta right now in front of me, so I'm going to use her organization as an example. So, in home care workers, as many of you know, under the new Affordable Care Act, there's a set of certificates that folks who do that work have to have. In her organization, she realized that if unless I get my folks that type of training and get those people to um, move up in the skill set, they were at risk of losing their jobs. And we're talking between three and 400 people and women over the age of 45. She, through her program and through the funds we were able to provide, helped to preserve those jobs. Those are the kinds of models that we're looking for, as well as the models that I talked about with Instituto and with the uh, National Latino Education Institute. Thank you. Excellent, and, and I appreciate the, and I should make a mention, of course, as a protocol respect that yes, as we now move into a new administration on a state level, um, we now have Governor-elect uh, Rauner, and of course, um, I look forward to being at that table, as I've always said, we will no longer be on the menu. Uh, but just looking around you and seeing the, the leadership in this room, that you are the network. And um, it's amazing, because we can refer to you as first name to show the longevity you all have and the important role you play as you walk as individuals. But when you come together, think about what's in, who's in this room. With that said and done, um, we're going to move right along. Uh, to uh, Elba Aranda Shu, and welcome. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Senator Delgado. I really uh, appreciate your leadership and everything that you've done for our thank community. You. And to our fellow, uh, my fellow panelists, um, you are, you know, wonderful leaders, and so I'm humbled, you know, to be uh, sharing a panel with you. Likewise, believe me. Likewise. And. Um, you know, kudos back to you, Julio, for all the work that you do in, in the state of Illinois. Um, unfortunately, NLA doesn't receive as much money from the state of Illinois, but that's another <laughs> discussion with regards to economic development and a lot of wallet. people. <laughs> A lot of people do not realize, I think, the, the enormous opportunity that the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity has and has the potential um, to do specifically for the Latino community. But that all goes back to um, policy at the greater level, at the, at the national level. So, um, so it's not just you know, an, an, an Illinois thing, but it's a, it's a national thing. Um, just a little bit about um, myself. Uh, well, first of all, I work for National Latino Education Institute. I'm uh, the organization's executive director. Um, I've been in that role for five years, succeeded uh, Mary Gonzalez Koenig. Um, the founder of the Spanish Coalition for Jobs. So many of you may know um, NLEI as the Spanish Coalition for Jobs, founded in the mid-1960s. Uh, um, and um, so the organization was founded and birthed with industry at the table. Um, early on, the organization and its founders and the people that organized were taking a look at better opportunities for Latinos in jobs. And so those are our roots and we were birthed there and so we've been working with employers from the very, very beginning. Um, a little bit about myself, I've been in the world of job training for over 20 years, can't believe that. Um, so I've seen um, a ver various legislation as well. Um, the end of CETA, um, hardcore JTPA, the, uh, the introduction of what was WIA, and then the reauthorization, but not updating, of the YIOA, whatever, the new uh, legislation, <laughs> which was reauthorized, but not really updated to, um, I think, a lot of the, um, the climate that we're trying to uh, work with in terms of getting, our, getting access to training and, and getting um, our people better prepared. Um, a couple of other things, um, in addition to NLEI, some things that might be a little relevant to this panel is I'm also on the uh, Illinois Latino Family Commission and the chair of the Economic Development Committee. And so some of the things that we are looking at is uh, better opportunities for Latinos in um, industries such as healthcare, um, and how are we going to be able to uh, help Latinos access the existing jobs? Because as you know, the state of Illinois is the second largest employer in the state of Illinois. 
So there are a lot of jobs that are available, and so we need to make sure that our community has access to them. And so to that end, I do invite you to a workshop we're having, um, the commission together with NLEI on December 11th. Um, to specifically learn about the various job opportunities within the state of Illinois. Um, and these are jobs that are not necessarily going to be affected by the new administration, FYI. Um, another thing is I'm also on the Illinois Workforce Healthcare Task Force <laughs> that took a look at um, healthcare employers. Um, what their needs are and what the state of Illinois is do doing uh, in a very you know, broad level. I'm happy to report that even before the report came out is that NLEI is offering training and educational programs in four of the occupations that the state identified are the top occupations in great demand and that desperately need bilingual talent. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about NLEI and then um, kind of move into some of the kind of issues I think that we need to take a look at and, and maybe perhaps providing some humble recommendations. Um, National Latino Education Institute changed its name to NLEI uh, because it, even though we were known as Spanish Coalition for Jobs, the important thing has always been from the very beginning, education. So we took a very purposeful look at ensuring that education was always going to be as part of the name because it is truly the economic tool in order to really um, combat poverty. Our focus has and continues to be to focusing on the capacity and the skills and the potential of the leaders of the family. And the leaders of the family can be a single parent, uh, a young adult, a mature worker, et cetera. And so um, we look at a very holistic approach in how to make sure that the head of the family has all of the tools necessary to break that cycle, to become independent, to have economic freedom, to have a path to higher learning, and to have a path for economic prosperity for themselves and the generations to come after them. But NLEI is a very unique hybrid. So we are a community-based organization. So we do work with programs you know, um, funded by the state. We continue to do direct employment services. We do adult education. And we do uh, a variety of job training um, initiatives. But additionally, we are also a nationally accredited school. And we are also a private business and trade school. So I realized. Um, actually even more recently this week um, in Washington, <laughs> that um, our uniqueness of this um, organization in Chicago that has these various lenses to be able to look at education, higher education, community-based grassroots, employer lens, adult education, and trades. Um, and you know, I keep realizing the um, the uniqueness of the organization. So I just wanted to explain that we are a community-based organization, but we also have the power to give our students credentials, to give our students certifications, because that's important to be able to compete, to be able to compete in all industries, not just healthcare. But equally to that, we want to make sure that the quality of care is there. So um, I tell our students, all, my students all the time, because one of the things that we offer is phlebotomy. Phlebotomy is offered as part of a comprehensive training program, but it's also offered as its own profession. So many times I tell the students, and we, tra we train at NLEI. Um, we are accredited by multiple uh, accrediting institutions, including KHEP, which is a very specialized um, healthcare accreditation. So we have the ability to offer them this credential, this uh, post-secondary credential. But for example, in terms of making sure that the quality of care is there is so important, and a lot of people do not realize how public health, quality of care, and workforce development is all connected. Because if we don't have the personnel that is able to provide culturally sensitive 
and high quality clinical care, then what are we producing? So it, it goes hand in hand. So with our, I start talking about the students, the phlebotomy students, you know, I say, I wanna be able to bring my mom, my kids, you know, because you start marking me up, you know. <laughs> and so we, we also teach how to be a patient advocate. So it, it's a very, you know, a very holistic approach. I'm very proud to say that our students rank above standards in their not only their educational attainment, and their competency levels, and clinical skills. So <laughs> they have uh, very low, very low risk in, um, in, um, in their phlebotomy and all their, their clinical procedures. And um, I'm, I'm gonna quickly do a shout out to a fellow panelist here, because she's been my employer. <laughs> she's employed many of our graduates. She's mentored many of our graduates. She's also a leader in healthcare as a profession because of all of the industries, one of the things that the organization does is fight for Latinos at different levels of talent. You know, from entry level to middle to upper to governance, right, to decision makers at the top. Because that's part of the equation in terms of the talent pipeline. And healthcare is not immune to that. In fact, when you look at Latinos and leaders of industry, healthcare is the one where, where Latinos are the least. Susana is a, is, 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 is a leader in that industry. So, um, so I had to, and I've been working with Susana for a long time. <laughs> so she knows, uh, first and foremost, the importance of quality of care, because she's a practitioner. She's been an employer. She's been a mentor and she's been a leader in her industry. So we have, um, she has her own success stories with some of my success stories, my, the people that we have served and trained. And so it truly takes a village to do that. And there are graduates in, our, in the audience of NLEI, so I'm happy to see. And we have another employer partner of NLEI in the audience, so we have several. And of course, Alivio Medical Center has also been a very um, important ally also in, the, in, the, in all the different areas that, it, that Susana is as well. But it does take a village to do this. We cannot look at healthcare training or the world of training for healthcare careers in silos. It's all, you know, it's all connected. So I wanted to touch on that. Some non-healthcare offerings that NLEI offers is business development, construction and pre-apprenticeship, technology, entrepreneurship, consumer education, and also job, you know, job placement continues at all levels, including executive. I'm gonna briefly go into some of our healthcare offerings. We do certified nursing assistant, medical office specialist, insurance and coding, phlebotomy, CPR training and certification, medical office assistant, pharmacy technician, EKG technician, and we're also a national center for certification called the NCCT Testing Center. But we also do preventative healthcare education, because again, it's all related. Quality of care is directly related, but also being a healthy worker is also part of the component. So preventative care education is equally important. So we, we, we battle, um, I shouldn't say battle, we address cancer, lung disease, diabetes, nutrition. Um, and it's, it's funny because a lot of the non-healthcare training students say, well, why don't we need to learn this? Why is this part of NLEI's curriculum? Why is this part of NLEI's you know, why, why, why are we mandated to learn this? And same thing with consumer education. And if you take a look at costs from an employer perspective and from an employee perspective, you know, we're doing our job to ensure that you have access to training. So part of that job is ensuring that you're uh, a smart consumer, so financial literacy is part of it, that you are uh, also smart in, in wellness because that's, gonna, that's, all, that's all going to be part of the whole smart worker, 
package. In terms of some of the trends that we see in the arena of healthcare education, I just want to share a couple of statistics. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor, Hispanics make up more than one in seven Americans, 15.4% in healthcare in terms of employment. But they account for only one in 17 in healthcare professionals. But yet, we hear the statistics about the enormous opportunity in healthcare professions. So we're not there, obviously. Globally, it is estimated that we need more than four million additional physicians, nurses, pharmacists, lab technicians, community health workers, and other frontline health workers. Serious shortage of culturally aware and credentialed faculty to provide quality training and continuing education. So in order for us to be able to even provide these train, this type of training um, that's going to be specifically addressing the gaps in the healthcare industry, we gotta have the talent to be able to provide the training to meet the gaps. So then we need the educators. So that's another, you know, it's another area that um, hasn't been, that where there is a big gap in addressing. Um, how am I with the time? And <laughs> right, and gonna, let's wrap it up. In yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> we'll wrap it up, no, I I'm gonna wrap it up. This is fascinating information Thank you're you. providing. <laughs> Please. Thank you. There's an appetite, obviously, but we have a limited time. Yes, that's absolutely. I, I've been called a workforce nerd, so I could, you know, talk about this for a long time. But there's very... Um, That's what we want to see, though, the entire year. I just don't like to have this conversation once a year. I go to General <laughs> Assembly, and then I show up here again the next year. I need to connect these to policy, money, and results. But please, let's, we can start, we can wrap up when you're ready, when you're ready. The end results. Um, we see some of our issues that I just um, outlined earlier as a shared responsibility. So it's not, you know, employer's fault, not education system's fault, it's not just the policy's fault. It really needs a comprehensive, collaborative effort, and we need to be honest about some of these gaps. And I mean from all sectors. You know, we've had the luxury of, um, we've built every single program and every service that we have with many employers at the table. And I'm talking the big ones and the small ones. So we've been able to, you know, immediately know um, what the shortages are, what competencies are needed, what types of certification is gonna be needed, and make sure that we do everything possible to ensure that the skill sets of our students and our communities are gonna be there. But that's not enough sometimes. Yep. And that's where policy. And policy we, is. <laughs> go ahead, please. Yeah, so policy is, is, very, is very key. And um, I'm gonna close with just reemphasizing that there's a, need, there's a need to be done to increase diversity in healthcare professions in order to realize the improved economic and healthcare outcomes of that result. There's a need and an effort to study and alleviate the barriers that keep Latinos from experiencing the virtues of education. We see an expanding role for technology. There's a need to look at technology to be leveraged more to address these gaps. Many healthcare problems among ethnic and racial minorities are either preventable or easily remedied. And I know my colleague will probably talk a lot about that. So we need more in access to prevention and affordable bilingual care, culturally incompetent and understandable medical information from a staff that is culturally sensitive to local population and ensure sufficient numbers of healthcare providers to serve our population. So policy, that's right, and thank you. And segueing right into that, what I've heard, and, and, and she's taken some of my minutes, because I'm gonna Whoops. keep quiet in a second, but we gotta segue into the next speaker. 
But what, what it describes to me is also a need for data collection system that will, as she pointed out, when you talk about public health, education, and all of these avenues, finding a career path, we're talking about the state of Illinois being able to have a data collection system where we can have, to help close these socioeconomic gaps in healthcare so that we can cover all these areas and they can interact with one another and we can go with a FOIA and get all this knowledge about this particular population in one place. With technology being the wave of now and the future, we're doing it in education. Duke University has a center on data collection. I have legislation on the Data Privacy Act, making sure that we don't you know, really pimp that information and sell it and, and, and use your information to market you, et cetera. So the Latino community really needs to have that data collected in all these areas so that then their work could be uh, better gauged when they get out into the field. So that's what I would really challenge and to start saying to grant writers, we need to put together a technological ability to gather that data. Um, with that said, and, and, and uh, she's brought up a litany, we should have a whole conference just on what Elba has brought up today. And it really, really disappoints me that I have to move on because this is what everybody in mainstream is talking about as we're moving America forward. We need wave makers and innovators right now. And that must also be done in a STEM and everything in STEAM and items that we're going to. They cannot all just be for profit schools. They must be reincorporated in our high schools and our colleges. And, and that's how we start. But with that said and done, let's keep on moving and let's keep in mind of the time, please. I have a time around and I had 11 at 10 minutes. I will uh, stop us at that moment because we are losing, uh, we are, uh, time is going against us. Uh, so now we have Mr. Juan Salgado and uh, we go back a quite a long time, but no further ado, Juan, please introduce yourself and your title. And uh, we got you on the clock for 10 minutes. Gotcha, gotcha. try to finish at nine. Um, but we do practice appreciative leadership in the Latino community. I think that's what makes us special. So um, I want to start by appreciating uh, the National Latino Education Institute because Mary and the organization was ar around, um, you know, holding people accountable. You know, at a time when there were few people holding people accountable to our organization. I see Carmen shaking her head. We appreciate Carmen's leadership because, you know, we live in a new world. We're still not in the world we want, but we live in a new world because there were people around at that time um, that were, were pushing accountability, right? And continue to push accountability. And, um, and, and Julio, you gotta have people inside of government that can help you navigate government. And we need more people inside of government yeah. to help our community uh, navigate in the government. And I know Carlos, you're working on that. And I know Elba, you're partnering, you just said so. Um, and, and, and when you said, Senator, um, you know, that uh, we're so blessed to have an amazing nurse um, on our panel. Um, I want you to know that that amazing nurse was there the moment three of my babies were born oh, wow. at McNeil Hospital. Yeah. And, and that she came up to make sure that everything was well. And she doesn't just do that for me. That's she right. does that for every baby that's born at McNeil Hospital when she's able to be there. That's right. And so, you know, that's right. but to me, that's what makes us unique. That's why we need to be more in the healthcare sector, right? And, um, and, 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 and of course, to Andrew, right? Because, you know, I mean, Andrew's running an organization that's of our own, you know? We know what makes us special sometimes. We can't be completely special when we don't completely run things, right? <laughs> but when we completely run things, we can really do some damage, right? <laughs> I mean, some positive damage, you know what I mean? And so, and I know, Senator Delgado, you've been all about, um, you know, figuring out how we start running more things, right? <laughs> yeah, self-sufficiency is the solution. Self-sufficiency is the solution. So, so I think, you know, I, I think it's so important to appreciate, you know, um, you know, the different elements that we have and, um, and, and to, to understand, you know, like what really drives our desire and where we should have common ground with private industry. Um, but, uh, but I want to talk about, you know, the other beauty uh, is that we've been building upon our strengths, right? And, and in the case of Instituto Preso Latino, 
You know, we started as adult education, Spanish literacy, English as a second language, um, working with, you know, immigrant community, right? Uh, and, and that was our strength. And I think sometimes we, we, we build upon those strengths. And in our case, you know, the work that we've done with Carreras and Salud has really been um, from that space, thinking critically about, wow, the people coming to us that are, you know, in level two English, we can see them as nurses tomorrow, you know? Where, you know, they walk into a lot of institutions and those institutions don't see that possibility, right? They don't plant that seed. Mm -hmm. um, they don't create the specific mechanisms that allow that person to actually make it from where they're at now to where they need to go. There's always a roadblock, okay? And for us, there's always a way to get that roadblock out of the way, right? And we're actively looking at moving the boulder from the road, right? And that's what makes it unique and different. And we're using our strengths because that's all we got, right? And so we build upon that. Um, and we're looking for systems change, right? Because it's not just about what we do, you know? What we do um, can help a good number of people. I'll share with Caras and Salud, you know, to date, We've helped uh, 70 folks become registered nurses, 319 become licensed practical nurses, 411 become certified nurses, right? Um, that's a good contribution, but it pales in comparison to what needs to happen out there. And the institutions that we're working with, and in our case, what we do is we partner with the City Colleges of Chicago, and we'll partner with any community college that's out there. Um, and why community colleges? Because they're affordable um, and, um, and because they're more flexible and because they have, you know, at least the right um, primary interest, not like these private colleges and universities that have another interest, which is a, 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 a profit-bearing interest, right? So, um, so we partner with the community colleges, uh, but part of our reason for partnering community colleges is systems change. How do we make those institutions better? Because right now, the one thing I want you to leave with, right, is there's no community college in this entire state that is doing fully right by our community, okay? And we need to put pressure on them, you know, in all kinds of different ways to be better, to take more risks. To, to include our community, to take those adult learners, they have expansive numbers of adult learners, and to see them as nurses and to open up those spots in all of their allied healthcare settings for those folks that are coming from our community. Um, because basically that's what we've done. And because we've shown it can be done, right? You know, we can speak very affirmatively, right? That there's no excuse for you not to be able to do it. And by the way, if you want to learn how to do it, we're happy to help you. If you want to partner for us, with us to help you do it, we're happy to partner with you, right? I mean, in some cases, the colleges should be coming to us and say, you know what, we'll give you this much money because you're going to make more money on the other end because we're going to get more students. That's not exactly happening yet, right? Um, but but we, we need to work to kind of make it happen. And, and we are um, as a community. And I, and I think, you know, Senator Delgado, you know, that I think is the beginning of the conversation, right? Yes, is. Is, is how do we take, especially in this transition period, right? How do we take what's working and make sure that the people outside the community, people outside the caucus, the new governor knows what's working and now makes a commitment to put pressure on those institutions mm -hmm. to start getting what's working working for us, right? And so I think that's a big next step that we need to take in this transition, right? You know, I, I can remember, Julio, when you guys asked us to go to the College of DuPage, and you asked us to go to a couple of other colleges, and, um, and, the, and the response we got from those colleges was, we don't need the help, we're just doing fine right now. But they're not doing fine right now. Um, if you talk to the employers, they're not doing fine right now. If you talk to our community members, they're not doing fine right now. And so um, I'd like to kind of put that on the table. And I guess um, I know I'm probably close to the uh, end of the time, right? Yeah, about three, about three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. So, um, so I think 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, right, I'll help you, right? I'll end in about a minute, right? Because I think, I think the biggest thing is to, to continue to make those systems change and continue to open up those doors. But I do want to say something about resources, right? Um, excellence drives resources, right? We've been fortunate, and we have to be driven to excellence. Um, and so we just got through, we're part of a 10-year evidence-based study by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, you know, because, you know, we were able to show a lot of metrics and over the last few years we've been studied by the Aspen Institute, right, um, and, and a couple of other folks. And so as a result of these studies, the U.S. government said, we want to study what you're doing. And we were able to get, you know, sufficient resources not just to sustain our program but to double it in size, right? And so excellence drives research. So even though there's not a lot of money coming out of DCEO, and even though the WIA dollars have shrunk, um, our dollars have grown exponentially because we've got large uh, foundations uh, that are putting in dollars from Ford to open societies because we have the U.S. government. Size. They're not studying. They're studying six places in the country, right? and they're putting their money into six places in the country. Well, guess what? Because we did this kind of work, one of those six places mm -hmm. is our community. And one of those six places is a place where the mom that walks in the door gets our service, right? So we can attract resources, right, when we do our best work, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the secondary message. We've got to change these systems, and we've got to attract resources, and we can. Right? And guess what the private sector does, man? Of course, they're all over it, right? Yeah. They're all over it, A, because we've proven that when the nurse is there, they do the extra things that matter, you know? You know, like Susana did with my family. She comes and visits my kids, right? And not everybody does that. But you know what? Latinos, we do that. That's what Latinos do, right? That's the difference that we are to the community. So I tell her story all the time, you know, to employers too. Say, so how would you like to have a nurse that does this for you? And they say, oh man, really? And, they say, and you don't tell people to do those kinds of things. It's not in the job description, right? It's in the heart, it's in the spirit, it's That's in the soul. Nice. So we've got a lot of greatness to give and I just want to keep us talking to the external world about that greatness that we have and that appreciative leadership and the, the difference we make to those environments. Wow. That's Mr. Juan Salgado. <laughs> Eloquent, touching. And, and Susana, it's, it's, we don't mean to embarrass her, it's just amazing. As a former DCFS worker in, in child abuse and neglect and have worked, done work with her and, and, and just in my own work back in the day, um, it talks about what you give, what you bring to the table versus uh, just the minimal standards of the procedures at DCFS. You, the human being, adds to what you do with those families. I appreciate your comments. I challenge and continue to challenge the Latino Family Commission, which I am the author of that legislation, and that is uh, funded and uh, continues to serve as a conduit to make sure that Bruce Rauner, the new governor, and the new administration have a conduit to be able to, you, the Latino Family Commission, was empowered uh, to do, and that is to lay out the agenda as to children and as to families. We base that legislation as to my days, as, as my work, and within the African American Caucus Family Foundation, which is a very proven method to get things done through state government. The Latino Family Commission, our sister and brother relationships with that caucus. As social economics bring us together in our healthcare, in our families, based on our realities in our community. Wang, you hit it right out of the park. With that said and done, and we know that we need the data-based collection system in order to have a concentrated warehouse, if you will, centralization of this information. 
Uh, with no further ado, we can segue right into that nurse who helped take care of those three beautiful babies. And that is an RN, uh, someone who has led my health, uh, my health committee and Senator Miguel Del Valle when he was there. As I'm a 17-year incumbent, the health fair went to 20 years, and this is the chairperson of the second legislative district health. Although I am cheating because that's I'm throwing her title in there from my district and the responsible person for serving over 55,000 Northwest Siders over that 20 years uh, with our name on it to provide free health care. And that's now uh, Susana Gonzalez and also RN Susana Gonzalez. And please indicate your title uh, officially and please proceed with 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, thank you, sir. Um, thank you, my colleagues um, at this table that I'm very humbled um, to be a part of. I wanna read you two things. One, the mission of the Chicago Bilingual Nurse Consortium, and then one, the mission of the Illinois Hispanic Nurses Association. And then I wanna um, segue to my colleague who will talk about a nursing institute vision and a dream um, of where we can house and work together for pathways and learning and teamwork. Um, uh, together, as the senator said, uh, I am a, a registered nurse and I am a pathway registered nurse. I have taken um, the licensed practical nurse route. I have taken my five years to finish a two year degree at a community college because of the barriers and the restrictions and what life does for us um, and, and, and the pathways that sometimes exist for, for our Latinos. And then it took me another five years to complete a BSN. But today I'll tell you I have two BSNs, I have two masters, and I want to mentor the next generation of Hispanic nurses and others that want any path in health career. So our mission of the Chicago Bilingual Nurse Consortium is to increase the number of internationally educated nurses, and we know that's another secret gem. For practice as bilingual, bicultural nurses in metropolitan Chicago and its surrounding communities, which we embrace and encompass our state. Through advocacy, education, and supportive services, and no one does it more culturally relevant than the CBNC. Now, as the president of the Illinois Hispanic Nurses, which is a chapter of non of the national, our mission is to, uh, we're a professional and we're volunteers, just like many of us are in this life, a uh, nonprofit healthcare organization. And our focus is again to enrich the lives of Hispanic nurses. We want to promote higher learning, advancement in the profession, cultural awareness, and active participation in our, in our Hispanic community. And part of this leadership is committed to mentor our next generation of Hispanic nurses and participate, as the Senator always said, sitting at the table and being part of the decision-making structure. And we keep hearing of pathways and we hear of bridges and we hear of linkages and we need those avenues because without that higher learning, that table at the top is not representative of the community that it wants to serve. So we got to figure that out as well as we keep doing workforce development for the people that need to get there. One thing I want to say yesterday, I listened to the president, and I love this. We are and always will be a nation of immigrants. We are strange. We were all strangers once. So I was uh, born and raised here in Chicago, but I came from a mom and dad from Puerto Rico who migrated here because they wanted opportunities for their children to have higher learning and better opportunities of health and wellness. And, and so that's sort of like the American dream or the vision of all people. So, you know, I, I really valued that yesterday. So one, Elba talks some facts, and, and I love Elba, so I like many of the facts she said. I wanna give you a couple facts because they go back to what Juan and I were talking about nursing, because that is my passion. When you find that passion of life and what you want to do and how you want to do it, this is what we need to, to do in this life to make it a better place. So mine is nursing. Hispanic nurses, there's like a little bit over 3 million nurses in the, in the nation. Only about 110,000 of those nurses are Hispanic or identify in some form of Latino, bilingual, bicultural, Spanish-speaking, um, uh, form. That's, 
you know, we, we hear 16%, 17%, quien cuenta a veces, you know, you know, plus or minus 53 million, yeah. dos o tres mm -hmm. más. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let, it depends on who was coming to my house and we say who lived there. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> Nena, la mariga que vive en tres. Nena, puede decir que somos siete. <laughs> so, you know, <clears throat> we have been there, I'm no sure we've heard it. But, <laughs> so nationwide, I think where I was going to is that we're still 3.6% of this healthcare population that can be educated at a high level of learning. And, and that's really what we wanted to advocate. And I think one of the things that you'll hear us pitch, Andrew, uh, uh, Dr. Sund, and myself is, you know, the idea of a nursing institute, the idea of a place where we can house some of the expert uh, bridging, some of the expert collaboration, some of the expert higher learning. As Juan was saying, sometimes our higher learning institutions fall short for us. They have the funds, they have the money, and they don't have us. They have small amounts of us. But the rest of us are still struggling through pathways. We're taking the licensed practical nurse route, which is wonderful, and there's lots of careers in, in the LPN, in the SNF industry, in the extended care, in the home care. When I see Marta, there's all these wonderful avenues. We can build those structures, but there still has to be some RNs with higher learning helping coordinate and delegate and make sure those programs are safe and that what we're doing is quality that Elba said. Quality health care is what we all deserve and what we all want. And the Affordable Care Act today gives us that opportunity to make sure our people find homes in health care for prevention, homes in health care for maintenance. But of course, I'm biased. I want them to be led by registered nurses. I want nurses in technology. I want nurses in electronic medical records. We want all kind of professions that are bilingual and by culture to all be at those, those tables. But for me, one of the things that's important is that nurses, today the future of nursing, the Institute of Medicine's report tells you that BSN needs to be a minimum criteria for the profession, for the professional registered nurse. We are all mandating that. We're all the consumers. I want someone to take care of me that knows what they're doing, that does it with the soundest of critical thinking and does it in the safest way. But you can't do it, and I want them to be culturally sensitive because I'm gonna tell you, even though I speak English, I like when someone I see speaks my language. Aunque me diga dos o tres palabritas, si no digo el español bien, te lo digo en inglés, or I'll describe what I'm trying to say. But we can communicate and that makes us very culturally bond. And I think sometimes that's what, when Juan says, I visit my patients, not because he's Hispanic, I visit it because it's the right thing to do. Did we meet your needs? Have we safely taken care of you, your wife, your baby that we brought into this world? Wherever I work, whether it is at a McNeil or whether it is at, a, at an Erie or whether it was at the Infant Welfare Society, which the senator embraced the fact that we know each other for como 20 años. Um, I was 12 when I started. <laughs> uh, you know, we age well también. <laughs> so anyway, I don't want to like further ado. Yeah, that's right. That's right. She, she can speak for herself. Right? Yeah. You know, herself. we're all really. I was born on very... Halloween. <laughs> oh, that's right. He has the best parties. But we were, you know, we all can give you good literature. We all can give good data. I'm looking at the audience, and I know with a passion who you are because you're making pathways yourselves and you've left imprints of health and imprints of great service out in our communities. So, you know, we, we need to inspire two or three more so we can get that word out. But the Sullivan Commission um, gave a report that said missing persons, minorities in the health profession. And this is not an old report, but we've heard it, and even if it's a decade ago or two, or just last month, it emphasizes the need for leadership commitment and accountability at the highest level in institutions of learning 
professional organization and government agencies, agencies to ensure participation and an increase of the underrepresented minority groups in the various health professions. We've touched many of the health professions, pathways, carreras in salud. Not that I want to plug in that December 18, we have a career fair at Carreras at Instituto de Progreso Latino, but it's important because those kids, those students, those adults, they need to meet with us and see, si, si se puede. You know, si se puede, we, we can do this. Even if it took me five years to finish a two-year degree, si se puede. Now, as we mentor the next generation, and I say that, con esta niña, Evelyn, can you just stand? Evelyn is like, tu, Evelyn. Evelyn, Evelyn, she's a, a young, an as, a, a aspiring Latina nurse, I mean, MSN. Hola, she, Evelyn. you know, she's a member of the <laughs> Illinois Hispanic Nurses. But this is what, this is the sprinkle of what we see. So, you know, she's working on her graduate projects. We're going to do some things together. But it shouldn't take Evelyn 20 years to finish school. Because right. Evelyn's going to do it in her four or her five. She'll get her master's and she'll be able to help. So that's kind of, I guess, where I was going on. So I think I want to just segue to my colleague that mm -hmm. will support the, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more of the policy decision um, of why we want to work together and, and we should continue our collaborative uh, workforce development for higher learning. And as you know, Dr. Andrew Sung, as the president of San Agustin College and as an educator, uh, a legislator, has uh, really taken this private college. It was, is the premier college uh, for these uh, for this path. And going forward, I realized that this morning as I move forward in my life, Dr. Andrew Sun. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, and and uh, thank you for being here. And I am also particularly happy and humbled of being here because uh, I do have a little uh, history with just about everybody in this panel. Also. Uh, <laughs> As Julio mentioned, we're very proud of some of the work we do with him at St. Augustine College that uh, we believe is very innovative, and that's a different panel someday that, yeah. that yeah. we can talk about that because it's not, not that much related to health. <laughs> and Juan and I, of course, we've known each other for a long time, and I'm always very proud to say, for those of you who do not know me that well, that my very first job in Chicago, when I moved to Chicago as a very young and idealistic man, I'm still idealistic, uh, yeah, not, not that. Don't stop, Doc, don't stop, don't stop. Just not that young, but my first job in Chicago was at the Instituto del Progreso Latino as, a, as an English teacher back in a particularly interesting period uh, back in the 80s. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of movement at the Instituto that was a part, a very enlightening uh, for me to work there at the time. Of course, my colleague to my left, Susana, and I are part of the Chicago Bilingual Nursing Consortium Board, and uh, we've been working together so much that I'm not even sure if I'm gonna add anything today because it's almost like it's the same ideas because we've been doing it together. And Senator Delgado is a good friend in Springfield that I've always said to many people, I feel like I'm going into class. I mean, he calls me doctor and educator, but when I go and visit with him, I both get a history about Illinois and the Senate, and also a lesson on how policy is done and uh, how it, it, it really works. Uh, not always how it should work, but how, <laughs> how, how it really works. So very happy to be here. And as mentioned, I'm the president of St. Augustine College, which is an institution, for those of you who are not that familiar, that's completely dedicated to serving the Latino community. By our mission statement, we were created with the purpose of serving the Latino community, and we have associate degrees and bachelor's degrees. Uh, and we actually have one degree in the healthcare area that's a respiratory therapy degree that's very successful. Um, many, many Latinos are completely completing that program. And we have a 100% passing rate in the NBRC, which is the external exam uh, necessary in order to become a therapist in, 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 in Illinois and a wonderful program. But also, I'm very proud of the work that we do with Susana and many other people I see here in the Chicago Bilingual Nursing Consortium, uh, which as uh, mentioned in the mission statement, our goal is to help a population that many people don't know exists, but it's truly here, which is internationally trained nurses. Me not all, but many of them uh, Latinas that uh, were trained in another country and cannot and are very knowledgeable 
and cannot perform uh, their jobs in Chicago, in the United States, because they don't have the license to practice here. And you find them doing other jobs, and we're losing a lot of talent. And the goal of our organization is to provide the uh, learning, but it's more than that, it's the support necessary so that they can achieve uh, the goal of becoming a registered nurse in, in, uh, in Illinois. And it's uh, great work. And as, is from that background that I'm coming, from those uh, sort of two backgrounds of being the president of the college <coughs> and, um, and part of this board, that I thought that as an educator, there's a couple of things I could contribute to the conversation today. Uh, one is that I do believe I come to this conference every year, and it's a great opportunity to learn new things, uh, to meet with college colleagues, uh, to least listen to our legislators uh, uh, about what priorities are happening in Springfield and the challenges they're facing. But at the same time, I think this is an opportunity for those of us who have similar goals and similar causes to get together and come up with new innovative ideas, things we can take to the future. And as you suggested, Senator, what can you take that really it's policy and, and mm -hmm. requires? And, um, we all know that in the healthcare field, we are underrepresented. Yes. Uh, we've heard some statistics, we don't need to repeat them. We're represented at all levels. And we all know also that uh, we need participation from our community at all levels. And it's, uh, we've heard many wonderful programs and many wonderful examples of uh, uh, different pathways that you can go into healthcare. Um, and funding sources. Uh, however, something that is a concern to some of us that uh, we've expressed is that we really want everybody that goes into this field to meet their full potential. And although we know that not everybody will go to college and get a nursing degree, some people will work very well at other levels, we need more people going to college and getting a nursing degree. 3%, you said? 3%. Uh, it's, not, it's not enough. No. We're not sufficiently represented. And what we've seen in our experience uh, uh, at the Chicago Bilingual Nursing Consortium and, and St. Augustine College, I guess, is that there is a community out there that really wants to enter this field. We know it both from the internationally trained nurses as well as from our community, from Little Village, from Humboldt Park to all our neighborhoods. There's people that really want to work in this field but they find uh, barriers. We see that there are barriers. Susanna mentioned a little bit of how difficult it was for her to move forward and get her degree, but she had something um, that I think it's a point that we need to build on and it's the work that we need to do together. She had resilience to get it done. And, and I'm sure there were barriers along the way that were tremendous, but she had the resilience to overcome them step by step. And what we need to create are the spaces to help tap into that resilience that exists in our community in order to achieve their goals. Uh, in a way, I sort of, uh, what one of the things that we would like to propose is that we understand that the population we serve as educators has financial barriers to attend uh, college or other training programs. And they have a variety of other barriers that are often intangibles that are a little harder to explain in terms of their needs to meet, uh, to, to, to meet family needs, to be uh, with their families. The background education that perhaps was not the best coming from some of our school systems and so on that create those barriers that requires a lot of resilience. And the concept I wanted to present, and maybe many of you are familiar with it, but is that we all talk about capital and that we need capital in order to be successful, but what's been very fashionable in academic environments for the past 10 or 15 years is to move beyond talking just about economic capital and needing money in order to achieve things, but is the concept of social and cultural ca capital and how elite groups really acquire that from birth and can access many of our educational systems uh, that we've created um, and many in our community cannot do that. And that's what we need to change. The goal is that perhaps we can think that it is true 
that many of us did not grow up in environments where we received the social and cultural capital to enter into uh, an institution of higher education. But that does not mean we're destined to not do it. It just means that we have, we have other, in our community, we have other forms of capital. We have resilience. We have communication skills. We have aspirational capital that we want to advance as a community. And we need to tap into um, those forces that exist in the Latino community, in Pilsen, in Little Village, in uh, other neighborhoods, tap into that to make sure that everybody who wants to enter into the health field and the nursing career can reach, and I guess it applies to the medical field too, to become doctors mm -hmm. also, they can reach the, the, uh, the highest goal they have to the best availability and that we create all the systems uh, around us to make sure that they have the Seamless. financial support, the Seamless. academic support, the cultural support, all the support necessary to assure that the best people in our neighborhoods will achieve and we can move uh, to higher numbers than just 3%. So one of uh, our goals is that I would like to challenge uh, all of us in, in our community, everybody present here, that we need to be working as a unit to create a space that anybody in Chicago that believes they want to enter into this wonderful field of helping others be healthy, uh, they know where to go and that we are all working together as a unit and it doesn't matter what level of education you have, what level of income, background education, how well you speak the English language or not if you're an immigrant, that you know there's a place that you, we can all come together uh, and uh, a place where you know you will be taken care of and you will find the best support so that it doesn't take, as Susana was saying, it doesn't take uh, 20 years to, to achieve a degree. It perhaps will take a little while to get it done, but you're in a supportive environment that's going to make it happen. And there's many good uh, initiatives that, has, that have happened in the Chicagoland area. Um, Juan just mentioned Carreras en Salud that's an excellent example. Uh, but we need to multiply those by 10, by 20, by 30 to achieve the levels that we need, or we'll continue to be part of the, what is it, the menu? You said. That's right, the <laughs> menu instead of at the table. So, so in that sense, that's the call that I would like to take from all of us today, that we all represent different organizations, funding sources, but we need to come together as a unit to create a pathway where we can assure that everybody can achieve their top, their top potential and become, um, CNAs, if that's, that's where, right. where their goal is, but become practice, uh, BSNs, if that's where their goal is, become doctors, if that's where their goal is, and they can all, uh, our community can participate fully in the healthcare field. And that's Dr. Andrew Sung, and he has a couple bricks and mortars right in my district, great colleges, and that's a great place everyone can convene, I'm sure, and here I'm taking the liberty to invite everyone there because there, that's exactly a great concept to close with. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the panel of the 2014 committee here. Julio Rodriguez, Selva Randasu, Juan Salgado, Susana Gonzalez, Andrew Sung, and your server, legislator William Delgado. And now it's your turn. We have about 15 minutes or so until I think the lunch is about noon. We got a half hour actually. And we're gonna utilize it, so please go address the microphone and feel free to uh, uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy it and, and give us your question, comment, um, and again, uh, we pray that not only keeping in mind 3.6%, I think in funding mechanisms, we're 17% of the state, but we don't see 17% of dollars coming through, and that is a big problem. Carmen Velasquez. Um, good morning. Uh, with the announcement of the president yesterday, um, he opened up the door for the professional uh, undocumented pers person. But I fear it for that person who is a nerd, and I say that respectfully, I don't say that disrespectfully. But we're talking about the people who are the undocumented who come from all over Latin America, Mexico, to come and be a nurse. And so I think we really have to look at what the Chicago Bilingual Nurse Consortium wants to do. We want to do a nurse institute. I want to do what you said, Juan. Mm -hmm. We don't want roadblocks. Tell me how to break the damn robots. I don't want you to tell me I have to do this and this and this. What is it, what's gonna open the door for me? 
What's going to open the door? What kind of support do I need? What kind of money can we receive so that we can make the Nurse Institute a reality? We will need the help of the Hispanic Latino Caucus to give us the money to do that. We need our space, and we want to do, we don't want to make an, uh, another entity. We want to say, let's put that Nurse Institute in San Agustin College. Why not? Let's make it our own. Because if we don't drive the car, somebody else is going to drive that car. And, and that's excellent. And keeping in mind, as we go to the next speaker real quickly, we need to do that. And, and if every legislator, and I'm, one of, I'm the veteran senior, I'm getting old, uh, legislator uh, that I found on the Northwest side and within the caucus, as I'm a founder of the Latino caucus, that w I will say first, any capital projects, every legislator, and a lot of us say we ought to take it to just my district and that district. Well, this is one we should say, let's carve a piece out of any future capital dollars and every member of the Latino caucus put it together for one purpose and that should be for a Latino nursing center. Because as we try our best to get it in the medical district, when we build the core center, we want a Guadalupe Reyes center that we wanted with Ed Valor and we still are waiting. So at what stage do we start to build institutions that reflect the work of all of us. So that's my commitment, and I'm on record. So let's see quien da más. If I, if I could just comment uh, briefly. Please, please, uh, please, yeah, and yeah, uh, I'd like to say that part of the concept that Carmen is mentioning that we would like to see that it's it. something that to the community is transparent. It's the Latino Nursing Institute. Many of us, many organizations, colleges could have a space there, but to the people it's transparent. It's the place you go to. You have my commitment. A matter of fact, thank you. Now I know why I came here today. Introduce yourself and Carmen. Thank you. Please. First of all, it's a comment. I would like to thank the panel. Uh, thank you. you did it. And by the way, on behalf of all of your people out here, I think each one of you have a gift on behalf of the Latino Caucus Foundation. Thank all of you guys. But go ahead. Senator, thank you very much for, for your kind words. Uh, my name is Carlos Chavez. I work for an agency called Rents Addiction Counseling Center, and I'm based in Elgin, Illinois. I just want to let you know that your comments, they're, they're wonderful, but they're all based in Chicago. Latinos don't live in Chicago only. Aurora is the second largest suburb with more than 60% of Latinos, and we're lacking of resources. Elgin, Carpentersville, Crystal Lake, we are lacking of resources. U46 is a school district from Elgin. It's the second largest school district in the state of Illinois. We are, we are smaller than one-tenth from Chicago public schools. Please, please, I'm begging you, please, give us some resources. Don't centralize your services in Chicago. It's the same way Chicago to Elgin than Elgin to Chicago. Can you imagine somebody who wants to go to San Agustin College mm -hmm. from Elgin, yeah. they have to drive two or three hours mm -hmm. because of the traffic to get their education. I don't think it's fair. Thank and you. please, please, one. I'm begging you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Susana Gonzalez yeah, wants to You know, to I, I really want to feed into his passion because something that um, Juan said earlier, and I mentioned, uh, or I heard it on our panel, things that work in Carreras and Salud and as pathways and in some of the workforce development, a, a, and something innovative is to bring satellites to our, our sister suburbs to, yes. <clears throat> to do on-site learning in that. It, so it, you still get a degree through this university, but the university is bridging and linking the pipeline on ramp. I love what you said, because you're right. Not everyone can come to this brick and mortar place but you know what happens today with technology is there is such a thing as a computer and there are classes that I can learn online right. and there's the education right. that I can get. Living in Elgin, I'm still a part right. of Instituto de Progreso Latino or I'm still a part of Carreras en Salud or I'm still a part now of an ADN or a BSN link program 
where we meet the standards, we, we meet the credentials to get them their degrees and their education. So you're very absolutely right, sir. That could, and, and let me point out real quickly, as being this is a state conference and we are the state legislature, you're absolutely right. Your senator is Senator Michael Nolan. His wife, I assisted her becoming a school board member in Unit 46. As you know, I'm the chairman of education in the Senate now. And Michael, and ella Latina, she's of Latina descent. And in Elgin, we have a large community from Puerto Rico, from Aguada, Puerto Rico, that's been living there since the Elgin clock days. As a doctor will tell you, I'm a historian from a little bit of jack of all trades and master of none. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure. So, so you get with your senator and you let him know you were in that workshop. He's a good friend of mine. But that's exactly how do we create that virtual reality and get Cisco maybe, partner with a Cisco, and let's get those TVs in there because we can. With just with all this technology, we are Jetsons, the Flintstones. So there is a way. And it's a compliment to St. Augustine. They should put some money in and open up in your city. If I, if I could comment very favor, quickly, very follow up very quickly, point well taken, point well taken, and we do need to address that. Uh, just to your point, we, St. Augustine, we just opened a site in Aurora because we, we understand that. So we have, and maybe Elgin will be next. We can talk. You got the best up here, folks. Identify yourself and feel free. Yes, I'm Paula Shipier. I'm a registered nurse, and uh, Susanna and I are buddies. And <laughs> I, I would like to think that I'm the Polish Susanna. Hey, uh, <laughs> Good evening. But my, my comment is to uh, talk to uh, what Carlos was saying. I think that it is very important for us to, you know, look at all of, you know, the areas. And at Robert Morris University, I taught medical assistants, and they came across very, very many of the barriers um, that we see with the Latina uh, uh, com uh, group, mm -hmm. but also for all of our international nurses. And um, so I am so very proud to be working with Susanna and Andrew and Carmen and Jose on the board. Uh, because I'm their new director for the Chicago Bilingual Nurse Consortium for Marketing and Fundraising. <laughs> That's what we need. That's right. Need so money. what I would like to do is ask you to pass these out at your workplaces, hang them up everywhere, because we are seeking those international nurses. Um, Dusseline is from Brazil. She has um, you know, joined us, uh, you know, here in America, and she is an extraordinary registered nurse. I just had six people from that graduated from our class last time. I teach the um, nurses to pass their state boards here in the United States, the NCLEX. And I had six of my dream team that were amazing. And you guys know that we had our lady from Cameroon who was um, at our fundraiser. And she drove to Springfield so that she wouldn't have to wait to take the test because she was so ready. Wow. She was so ready. Good stuff. And she passed. So we have a new registered nurse who is trilingual, who can speak to exactly what Susanna was talking about from your heart with your own compassion, in your own language. Yes. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's what we need. And Chicago is a city of many languages. And 102 counties, as I travel from Saline and Gallatin County, which is on the border of Kentucky, where they only have one medical clinic, and they have no, and only have eight RN there. Now, these are poor Appalachian whites, African Americans. And by the way, now we have new migrants, immigrants working there, all the way to McHenry County. Good Senator, after good morning. Senator, I, I please, wanted, I please. wanted to address before Jump the in. next person comes Jump because in. I think it's really important for, for the, the suburban question, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to offer up, you know, we have uh, experience in, in, in how to get community colleges to do what they should be doing right now, and then to work with the workforce board, right? So I would say to anyone in the suburbs, Elgin or anywhere else, right, the reality is for us to hit the increases in numbers, those community colleges have to change practice. Yes, I And am. those workforce boards have to open up their resources, okay? And so I want to offer up to anyone here from the suburbs who's a leader, I will work with you. Our organization will work with you. To and make I sure will work with you and work with you. Open up those doors, right. whatever it takes, you know, right. to open up those doors. Yep. Because that has to happen now. Yep in those places. And yes. I'll be more than willing to be the convener of those meetings and get yes. your legislator at the table. Yeah. Senator, I just, I think what Juan just said is really critical. When I asked Juan to go to the College of DuPage, they really, they, their answer to him was really about, this isn't a priority for us. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. We have got to get into the conversation locally. Wow. And it's not just Elgin and Aurora, it's Waukegan. That's right. It's Beardstown. That's right. It's the migrants in Southern Illinois. That's right. I mean, they're, we're sitting in these communities and these college, we are right now in the process of forcing them to strategic planning. But you all have to be at the table. Yes. Because I can drive resources, but if the same people are telling me what the priorities are, then there's no way for me to get past that conversation. So can you hear to that? Do you hear that? That's a very important yeah. point yeah. to work with. It connects yeah. the next train. Yeah. And I would send everybody in this room the contact of every director for every workforce board, and you should ask them, how do you get nominated to a board? And the right in DuPage County, they have their own board. But trust me, those folks aren't soliciting you to come onto that board. You have to begin to the making table. table. You know, as, as the senator said, let's get off the menu yeah. and create our own table. Oh. Because we've got to do it because this is a critical time. You know, yep, so. and we have very good friends in DuPage now, Senator Tom Cullerton yes. and, and a couple other ones now. Good afternoon. Identify yourself for the record and ask your question, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jorge Girardi, uh, and I'm not a registered nurse. <laughs> uh, but I've, but I've been married. Nurses. I've been married to one for 33 years. That's right. Done some know. great work over the years. Uh, but uh, I'm an associate dean at the University of Illinois College of Medicine, and I direct the Hispanic Center of Excellence there. Uh, and I just want to, uh, Senator, to thank you so much for your leadership and the support of the caucus uh, from the mid uh, 2000s, uh, when unfortunately we lost the federal funding that we had for the center. Then Senator Del Valle and the caucus has provided continuous support for our work. Um, and my comment is that uh, the common denominator for all the health professions is a strong background in, in math and science. Yes. That begins not in college or even high school, but in elementary school and even kindergarten. Yes. Uh, and so uh, I'm all, as I get older, I'm getting more impatient. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we need accountability for every one of our institutions that educate our, our children. I'm all for um, people, like you said, reaching to the highest potential. And my goal for the last 34 years has been to get more Latino doctors. I'm very proud that our medical school is actually responsible for graduating three of every five Latino MDs in the state of Illinois. We have That's seven medical beautiful. schools in the state. But, and as you know, you have one of my students, uh, Alejandra Cano, right. who will become we'll, a doctor. We'll be yes. graduating in, in the spring. Alex. But we've graduated over 1,200 Latino MDs since 1980. But we're still like 4% of all the practicing physicians in the state of Illinois, 4% when our population is close to 17%. That's correct. So we're, 3%. we're doing, we're finishing a study that's actually supported by the National Institutes of Health with five high schools in the city, 2,800 Latino high school students, asking them about science. What we're finding actually, they come to high school with a strong interest in science and desire to do science. They understand the value of science to society. By the 11th grade, They've lost that interest. Mm -hmm. Something is going on in high school that deters our kids with the talent and the interest to keep on track for those careers. And if you don't do well in high school, there's not a lot of possibility after that. And that's why as a chair of education, I'm really pushing in, in STEM in our schools. And I'm actually walking to my schools right now, 13. We have a five minutes here uh, left here. So we totally agree. And that is the wave of the future. And that is to make sure that science and, and engineering and, mecha and math is added, something that we got to continue to do. Our panel, we have five minutes. If there's any other questions, if any of the panel want to uh, jump in and make comments, uh, look around you. You have people here in all walks of life. Please network. You have people hearing strong public relations from chambers, uh, from the Latino chambers, and they've created their own entities. You have doctors here, nurses here. You have all of us, a lot of our. So when you talk to each other, it's really important because, and then that's how we connect also as we leave this room. And then as it comes back, you guys are a conduit into my surge switch. You're all individual, individual surge switches come into our surge in the General Assembly in the Latino caucus. My role for them is to make sure, even though I'm chairing education now, Linda Chapalavia is doing an excellent job in the house with education, and she's leading that over there from Aurora for us right now. And my focus and concentration for 15 years has been public health and a lot of my background, so that's why I'm here. But my, of course, as a leader of our caucus, is how do we translate this into action? How do we now have something on the agenda and been challenged by one of our deans of our community and mental health community and, and, and physical health, and that is to get a center 
That is to set up some meetings and for me to start convening with the other generals. In the, uh, if this was a cruise ship, we need no captains. There are generals up in here. And we're able to sit down and bring the Cisco's to the table to bring some possible fun. Here are these leaders. How do we connect? Because I want to see the next stage. I do not want to. I will, matter of fact, I don't think I will be moderator next year if I don't have a meeting about this within the next six months. Because I will be calling you. Because this is so real that we will leave a footprint in the beginning. And this generates money. We need wave makers and innovators. And this is the time. It's about all of America, and we must lead. Keep this state a world-class state. We are the hub of America, and Chicago is a world-class city. We must transition like cities in San Antonio. We must be able to do what they do in Dade counties when populations before ours are majority populations. They must work with all people of different nationalities and colors and socioeconomics. They must have a sensitivity to their constituents and have access to the dollars that state government and federal government has access and stop with the flag waving and the parades. And let's get into the nitty gritty and in interpreting what's standing around you, who's standing around you in those parades. Those families need that services. We have a university. We have leadership in the medical community and nursing. We have our educators. We have the facilities. We have the abilities. Now we must put, bring them all together and have an interdependent relationship with one another. All these pearls must be put on one necklace. And I challenge you to challenge me as I'm willing to convene this, to sit down and see with the great experience from a university leader to help me, guide me in the Illinois State Board of Education, higher education, and Dr. Phillips, and knowing how to best get this. How do we get a data center, a privacy center to protect our, our data from, from breach? and making sure that we're able to follow the student all the way when she starts in the CNN or he, go all the way through their PhD and their doctorates maybe, to follow them through the labor market, to the labor department, Department of Public Health, Department of Human Services, Department of Education. We need a hub and spoke system that will have access to all this knowledge and then that you can monitor it. That we make sure that knowledge has access just through a push of a button. Because if not, then I've failed you. And we have failed that communities. And let's get these health fairs up. Let's get them back into the communities. But every Walgreens, and I want to put a shout out to CVS who says no more tobacco. And no more, we want to make sure that prescription drugs are safe as we rewrite these prescription drugs. Let's make sure for every prescription they fill, make sure that they can put a dollar back in that community. Let's make sure that hydrocortisone and Vicodin isn't the number one prescription in America, let alone in Illinois, with all the drug interaction deaths that have occurred, which I actually even took my oldest son. So let's look at all of these things, but it's our responsibility. Let's stop waiting for someone to tell us about it, and let's get that nurse ready to get into the field, because here's your curriculum and here's your education component of everything we've been talking about the last few years as I've moderated your workshops, and that is on diabetes and metabolic syndrome, uh, on HIV and the communities of, uh, and asthma. All of the things that were prominent and prevalent in that communities, in retrospect, in the five years now that I have had my son with Jesus, I have not seen significant policy changes and statutes to be able to match the amount of work that I get when I come here to meet with all of my professionals. And I have left some challenges. And, and I have to make decisions, too, as I've evolved, because the city of Chicago needs us. As you look around, as I'm touring my schools, five out of five seem to be brown. In my district, 88% need a minimum wage hike. Those familias are there, they're immigrants, they're Polish and they're Mexicano and they're from Croatia. <coughs> okay, so we need to. We have international nurses I didn't even dream, think about. We have Dr. Sun who can lead us on that. So now it's time to bring that together and I say, we're gonna see this real. So with that said and done, this concludes our, our, our panel. Let's give them a great round of applause.